William IV of the United Kingdom. William IV was King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and King of Hanover from 26 June 1830 until his death in 1837. The third son of George III, William succeeded his elder brother George IV, becoming the last king and penultimate monarch of Britain's House of Hanover. William served in the Royal Navy in his youth, spending time in North America and the Caribbean, and was later nicknamed the Sailor King. In 1789, he was created Duke of Clarence and St. Andrews. In 1827, he was appointed as Britain's first Lord High Admiral since 1709. As his two older brothers died without leaving legitimate issue, he inherited the throne when he was 64 years old. His reign saw several reforms the poor law was updated, child labor restricted, slavery abolished in nearly all of the British Empire and the British electoral system refashioned by the Reform Act 1832. Although William did not engage in politics as much as his brother or his father, he was the last monarch to appoint a prime minister contrary to the will of Parliament. Through his brother Adolphus, the Viceroy of Hanover, he granted his German kingdom a short-lived liberal constitution. At the time of his death William had no surviving legitimate children, but he was survived by eight of the ten illegitimate children he had by the actress Dorothea Jordan with whom he cohabited for 20 years. Late in life, he married and apparently remained faithful to the young princess who would become Queen Adelaide. William was succeeded in the United Kingdom by his niece Victoria and in Hanover by his brother Ernest Augustus. William was born in the early hours of the morning on August 21, 1765 at Buckingham House, the third child and son of King George III and Queen Charlotte. He had two elder brothers, George and Frederick, and was not expected to inherit the crown. He was baptized in the Great Council Chamber of St. James's Palace on September 20, 1765. His godparents were his paternal uncles, the Duke of Gloucester and Prince Henry, and his paternal aunt, Princess Augusta, then hereditary Duchess of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. He spent most of his early life in Richmond and at Kew Palace, where he was educated by private tutors. At the age of 13, he joined the Royal Navy as a midshipman and was present at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1780. His experiences in the Navy seem to have been little different from those of other midshipmen, though in contrast to other sailors he was accompanied on board ships by a tutor. He did his share of the cooking and got arrested with his shipmates of Terra Drunken Brawl and Gibraltar, he was hastily released from custody after his identity became known. He served in New York during the American War of Independence making him the only member of the British royal family to visit America up to and through the American Revolution. While William was in America, George Washington approved a plot to kidnap him, writing, The spirit of enterprise so conspicuous in your plan for surprising in their quarters and bringing off the Prince William Henry and Admiral Digby merits applause, and you have my authority to make it attempt in any manner, and at such a time, as your judgment may direct. I am fully persuaded that it is unnecessary to caution you against offering insult or indignity to the persons of the prince or admiral. The plot did not come to fruition, the British heard of it and assigned guards to William, who had until then walked around New York unescorted. In September 1781, William held court at the Manhattan home of Governor Robertson. In attendance were Mayor David Matthews, Admiral Dibgee, and General Delancey. He became a lieutenant in 1785 and captain of the following year. In late 1786, he was stationed in the West Indies under Horatio Nelson, who wrote of William, in his professional line, he is superior to two-thirds, I am sure, of the, naval, list, and in attention to orders, and respect to his superior officer, I hardly know his equal. The two were great friends, and dined together almost nightly. At Nelson's wedding, William insisted on giving the bride away. He was given command of the frigate in 1788, and was promoted to rear admiral in command of the following year. William sought to be made a duke like his elder brothers, and to receive a similar parliamentary grant, but his father was reluctant not to put pressure on him. William threatened to stand for the House of Commons for the constituency of Totnes and Devon. Appalled at the prospect of his son making his case to the voters, George III created him Duke of Clarence and St. Andrews and Earl of Munster on May 16, 1789, supposedly saying, I well know it is another vote added to the opposition. William's political record was inconsistent and, like many politicians of the time, cannot be certainly ascribed to a single party. He allied himself publicly with the Whigs as well as his elder brothers George, Prince of Wales, and Frederick, Duke of York, who were known to be in conflict with the political positions of their father.
William ceased his active service in the Royal Navy in 1790. When Britain declared war on France in 1793, he was anxious to serve his country and expected a command, but was not given a ship, perhaps at first because he had broken his arm by falling down some stairs drunk, but later perhaps because he gave a speech in the House of Lords opposing the war. The following year he spoke in favor of the war, expecting a command after his change of heart, none came. The Admiralty did not reply to his request. He did not lose hope of being appointed to an active post. In 1798 he was made an admiral, but the rank was purely nominal. Despite repeated petitions, he was never given a command throughout the Napoleonic Wars. In 1811, he was appointed to the honorary position of Admiral of the Fleet. In 1813, he came nearest to any actual fighting, when he visited the British troops fighting in the Low Countries. Watching the bombardment of Antwerp from a church steeple, he came under fire, and a bullet pierced his coat. Instead of serving at sea, he spent time in the House of Lords, where he spoke in opposition to the abolition of slavery, which although not legal in the United Kingdom still existed in the British colonies. Freedom would do the slaves little good, he argued. He had traveled widely and, in his eyes, the living standard among freemen in the highlands and islands of Scotland was worse than that among slaves in the West Indies. His experience in the Caribbean, where he quickly absorbed the plantation owner's views about slavery, lent weight to his position, which was perceived as well argued and just by some of his contemporaries. In his first speech before Parliament, he called himself an attentive observer of the state of the Negroes who found them well cared for and in a state of humble happiness. Others thought it shocking that so young a man, under no bias of interest, should be earnest in continuance of the slave trade. In his speech to the House of Lords, William insulted William Wilberforce, the leading abolitionist, saying, The proponents of the abolition are either fanatics or hypocrites, and in one of those classes I rank Mr. Wilberforce. On other issues, he was more liberal, such as supporting moves to abolish penal laws against dissenting Christians. He also opposed efforts to bar those found guilty of adultery from remarriage. From 1791, William lived with an Irish actress, Dorothea Bland, better known by her stage name, Mrs. Jordan, the title Mrs. being assumed at the start of her stage career to explain an inconvenient pregnancy in Jordan because she had crossed the water from Ireland to Britain. William was part of the first generation to grow to maturity under the Royal Marriages Act 1772, which forbade descendants of George II from marrying unless they either obtained the monarch's consent or, if over the age of 25, gave 12 months' notice to the Privy Council. Several of George III's sons, including William, chose to cohabit with the women they loved, rather than seek a wife. Having legitimate issue was not a primary concern for William, as he was one of the younger sons of George III. He was not expected to figure in the succession, which was considered secure once the Prince of Wales married and had a daughter, Princess Charlotte, second in line to the throne. William appeared to enjoy the domesticity of his life with Mrs. Jordan, remarking to a friend, Mrs. Jordan is a very good creature, very domestic and careful of her children. To be sure she is absurd sometimes and has her humors. But there are such things more or less in all families. The couple, while living quietly, enjoyed entertaining with Mrs. Jordan writing in late 1809, we shall have a full and merry house this Christmas, tis what the dear Duke delights in. George III was accepting of his son's relationship with the actress, in 1797, he created William Ranger of Bushy Park, which included a large residence, Bushy House, for William's growing family. William used Bushy as his principal residence until he became king. His London residence, Clarence House, was constructed to the designs of John Nash between 1825 and 1827. The couple had ten illegitimate children, five sons and five daughters, nine of whom were named after William's siblings, each was given the surname Fitzclarence. Their affair lasted for twenty years before ending in 1811. Mrs. Jordan had no doubt as to the reason for the breakup, money, money, my good friend, has, I am convinced made him at this moment the most wretched of men, adding, with all his excellent qualities, his domestic virtues, his love for his lovely children, what must he not at this moment suffer? She was given a financial settlement of £4,400 designated for their maintenance. After Mrs. Jordan's acting career began to fail, she fled to France to escape her creditors, and died, impoverished, near Paris in 1816. Before he met Mrs. Jordan, William had an illegitimate son whose mother is unknown, the son, also called William drowned off Madagascar in HMS Blenheim in February 1807. Caroline von Linsingen, 
whose father was a general in the Hanoverian infantry, claimed to have had a son, Heinrich, by William in around 1790 but William was not in Hanover at the time that she claims and the story is considered implausible by historians. Deeply in debt, William made multiple attempts at marrying a wealthy heiress such as Catherine Tylney Long, but his suits were unsuccessful. Following the death of William's niece Princess Charlotte of Wales, then second in line to the British throne, in 1817, the king was left with twelve children, but no legitimate grandchildren. The race was on among the royal dukes to marry and produce an heir. William had great advantages in this race, his two older brothers were both childless and estranged from their wives, who were both beyond childbearing age anyway, and William was the healthiest of the three. If he lived long enough, he would almost certainly ascend the British and Hanoverian thrones, and have the opportunity to sire the next monarch. William's initial choices of potential wives either met with the disapproval of his eldest brother, the Prince of Wales, or turned him down. William's younger brother Adolphus, the Duke of Cambridge, was sent to Germany to scout out the available Protestant princesses. He came up with Princess Augusta of Hesse Cassel, but her father Frederick declined the match. Two months later, the Duke of Cambridge married Augusta himself. Eventually, a princess was found who was amiable, home loving, and was willing to accept, even enthusiastically welcoming William's nine surviving children, several of whom had not yet reached adulthood. In the drawing room at Kew Palace on July 11, 1818, William married Princess Adelaide of Saxe-Meiningen, the daughter of George I, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen. At 25, Adelaide was half William's age. Their marriage, which lasted almost 20 years until William's death, was a happy one. Adelaide took both William and his finances in hand out for their first year of marriage. The couple lived in economical fashion in Germany, and William's debts were soon on the way to being paid especially since Parliament had voted him an increased allowance, which he reluctantly accepted after his requests to have it increased further were refused. William is not known to have had mistresses after his marriage. The couple had two short-lived daughters and Adelaide suffered three miscarriages. Despite this, false rumors that Adelaide was pregnant persisted into William's reign, he dismissed them as damned stuff. William's elder brother, the Prince of Wales, had been Prince Regent since 1811 because of the mental illness of their father. George III. Died in 1820, the king died, leaving the crown to the prince regent, who became George IV. William, Duke of Clarence, was now second in the line of succession, preceded only by his brother, Frederick, Duke of York. Reformed since his marriage, William walked for hours, ate relatively frugally, and the only drink he imbibed in quantity was barley water flavored with lemon. Both of his older brothers were unhealthy, and it was considered only a matter of time before he became king. When the Duke of York died in 1827, William, then more than 60 years old, became heir presumptive. Later that year, the incoming Prime Minister, George Canning, appointed him to the office of Lord High Admiral, which had been in commission since 1709. While in office, William had repeated conflicts with his council, which was composed of admiralty officers. Things finally came to a head in 1828 when, as Lord High Admiral, he put to sea with a squadron of ships leaving no word of where they were going, and remaining away for ten days. The king, through the prime minister, by now Arthur Wellesley, first Duke of Wellington, requested his resignation, he complied. Despite the difficulties William experienced, he did considerable good as Lord High Admiral. He abolished the cat and nine tails for most offenses other than mutiny, attempted to improve the standard of naval gunnery, and required regular reports of the condition and preparedness of each ship. He commissioned the first steam warship and advocated more. Holding the office permitted him to make mistakes and learn from them, a process that might have been far more costly if he had not learned before becoming king that he should act only with the advice of his counselors. William spent the remaining time during his brother's reign in the House of Lords. He supported the Catholic Emancipation Bill against the opposition of his younger brother, Ernest Augustus, Duke of Cumberland describing the latter's position on the bill as infamous, to the Duke of Cumberland's outrage. George IV's health was increasingly bad, it was obvious by early 1830 that he was near death. The king took his leave of his younger brother at the end of May, stating, God's will be done. I have injured no man. It will all rest on you then. William's genuine affection for his older brother could not mask his rising anticipation that he would soon be king. When King George IV died on June 26, 1830 without surviving legitimate issue, William succeeded him as King William IV. Aged 64, he was the oldest person yet to assume the British throne. 
Unlike his extravagant brother, William was unassuming, discouraging pomp and ceremony. In contrast to George IV, who tended to spend most of his time in Windsor Castle, William was known, especially early in his reign, to walk, unaccompanied, through London or Brighton. Until the reform crisis eroded his standing, he was very popular among the people, who saw him as more approachable and down to earth than his brother. The king immediately proved himself a conscientious worker. His first Prime Minister Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, stated that he had done more business with King William in ten minutes than he had with George IV in as many days. Lord Brougham described him as an excellent man of business, asking enough questions to help him understand the matter, whereas George IV feared to ask questions lest he display his ignorance and George III would ask too many and then not wait for a response. The king did his best to endear himself to the people. Charlotte Williams when wrote shortly after his accession, Hitherto the king has been indefatigable in his efforts to make himself popular, and do good-natured and amiable things in every possible instance. Emily Eden noted, he is an immense improvement in the last unforgiving animal, who died growling sulkily in his den at Windsor. This man at least wishes to make everybody happy, and everything he has done has been benevolent. William dismissed his brother's French chefs and German band, replacing them with English ones to public approval. He gave much of George IV's art collection to the nation, and had the royal stud. George IV had begun an extensive renovation of Buckingham Palace, William refused to reside there, and twice tried to give the palace away, once to the army as a barracks, and once to Parliament after the Houses of Parliament burned down in 1834. His informality could be startling, when in residence at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, King William used to send to the hotels for a list of their guests and invite anyone he knew to dinner, urging guests not to bother about clothes. The Queen does nothing but embroider flowers after dinner. Upon taking the throne, William did not forget his nine surviving illegitimate children, creating his eldest son Earl of Munster and granting the other children the precedence of a younger son of a Marquess. Despite this, his children importuned for greater opportunities, disgusting elements of the press who reported that the impudence and rapacity of the Fitzjordans is unexampled. The relationship between William and his sons was punctuated by Asterius off Savage and, for the king at least, painful quarrels over money and honors. His daughters, on the other hand, proved an ornament to his court, as, they are all, you know, pretty and lively, and make society in a way that real princesses could not. At the time, the death of the monarch required fresh elections and, in the general election of 1830, Wellington's Tories lost ground to the Whigs under Charles Grey, 2nd Earl Grey, though the Tories still had the largest number of seats. With the Tories bitterly divided, Wellington was defeated in the House of Commons in November, and Lord Grey formed a government. Grey pledged to reform the electoral system, which had seen few changes since the 15th century. The inequities in the system were great, for example, Large towns such as Manchester and Birmingham elected no members, while small boroughs, known as rotten or pocket boroughs, such as Old Sarum with just seven voters, elected two members of parliament each. Often, the rotten boroughs were controlled by great aristocrats, whose nominees were invariably elected by the constituents, who were, most often, their tenants, especially since the secret ballot was not yet used in parliamentary elections. Landowners who controlled seats were even able to sell them to prospective candidates. When the House of Commons defeated the first reform bill in 1831, Gray's ministry urged William to dissolve Parliament, which would lead to a new general election. At first, William hesitated to exercise his prerogative to dissolve Parliament because elections had just been held the year before and the country was in a state of high excitement which might boil over into violence. He was, however, irritated by the conduct of the opposition which announced its intention to move the passage of an address, or resolution, in the House of Lords, against dissolution. Regarding the opposition's motion as an attack on his prerogative, and at the urgent request of Lord Grey and his ministers, William IV prepared to go in person to the House of Lords and prorogue Parliament that the monarch's arrival would stop all debate and prevent passage of the address. When initially told that his horses could not be ready at such short notice, William is supposed to have said, then I will go in a hackney cab. Coach and horses were assembled quickly and William immediately proceeded to Parliament. Said the Times of the scene before William's arrival, it is utterly impossible to describe the scene, the violent tones and gestures of noble lords, astonished the spectators, and affected the ladies who were present with visible alarm. Lord Londonderry brandished a whip, threatening to thrash the government supporters, and was held back by four of his colleagues. 
William hastily put on the crown, entered the chamber, and dissolved Parliament. This forced new elections for the House of Commons, which yielded a great victory for the reformers. But although the House of Commons was clearly in favor of parliamentary reform, the House of Lords remained implacably opposed to it. The crisis saw a brief interlude for the celebration of the king's coronation on September 8, 1831. At first, William wished to dispense with the coronation entirely, feeling that his wearing the crown while proroguing Parliament answered any need. He was persuaded otherwise by traditionalists. He refused, however, to celebrate the coronation in the expensive way his brother had. The 1821 coronation had cost £240,000, of which £16,000 was merely to hire the jewels. At William's instructions, the Privy Council budgeted less than £30,000 for the coronation. When traditionalist Tories threatened to boycott what they called the half crown nation, the king retorted that they should go ahead, and that he anticipated greater convenience of room and less heat. After the rejection of the second reform bill by the Upper House in October 1831, agitation for reform grew across the country, demonstrations grew violent, and so called reform riots. In the face of popular excitement, the Grey Ministry refused to accept defeat in the House of Lords, and reintroduced the bill, which still faced difficulties in the House of Lords. Frustrated by the Lords' recalcitrance, Grey suggested that the King create a sufficient number of new peers to ensure the passage of the Reform Bill. The King objected, though he had the power to create an unlimited number of peers, he had already created 22 new peers in his coronation honours. William reluctantly agreed to the creation of the number of peers sufficient to secure the success of the bill. However, the king, citing the difficulties with the permanent expansion of the peerage, told Grey that the creations must be restricted as much as possible to the eldest sons and collateral heirs of existing peers, so that the created peerages would eventually be absorbed as subsidiary titles. This time, the lords did not reject the bill outright, but began preparing to change its basic character through amendments. Grey and his fellow ministers decided to resign if the king did not agree to an immediate and large creation to force the bill through in its entirety. The king refused, and accepted their resignations. The king attempted to restore the Duke of Wellington to office, but Wellington had insufficient support to form a ministry and the king's popularity sank to an all time low. Mud was slung at his carriage and he was publicly hissed. The king agreed to reappoint Gray's ministry, and to create new peers if the House of Lords continued to pose difficulties. Concerned by the threat of the creations, most of the bill's opponents abstained and the Reform Act 1832 was passed. The mob blamed William's actions on the influence of his wife and brother, and his popularity recovered. William distrusted foreigners, particularly anyone French, which he acknowledged as a prejudice. He also felt strongly that Britain should not interfere in the internal affairs of other nations, which brought him into conflict with the interventionist foreign secretary, Lord Palmerston. William supported Belgian independence and, after unacceptable Dutch and French candidates were put forward, favoured Prince Leopold of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, the widower of his niece, Charlotte, as a candidate for the newly created Belgian throne. Though he had a reputation for tactlessness and buffoonery, William could be shrewd and diplomatic. He foresaw that the potential construction of a canal at Suez would make good relations with Egypt vital to Britain. Later in his reign, he flattered the American ambassador at a dinner by announcing that he regretted not being born a free, independent American, so much did he respect that nation, which had given birth to George Washington, the greatest man that ever lived. By exercising his personal charm, William assisted in the repair of Anglo-American relations, which had been so deeply damaged during the reign of his father. William never visited Hanover as its king. His brother, Prince Adolphus, Duke of Cambridge, acted as viceroy there throughout William's reign as he had throughout George IV's reign. Public perception in Germany was that Britain dictated Hanoverian policy. This was not the case. In 1832, Metternich introduced laws that curbed fledgling liberal movements in Germany. Britain's Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston opposed this and sought William's influence to cause the Hanoverian government to take the same position. The Hanoverian government instead agreed with Metternich, much to Palmerston's dismay, and William declined to intervene. The conflict between William and Palmerston over Hanover was renewed the following year when Metternich called a conference of the German states, to be held in Vienna, and Palmerston wanted Hanover to decline the invitation. Instead, the viceroy accepted, backed fully by William. In 1833, William signed a new constitution for Hanover, which empowered the middle class, gave limited power to the lower classes, and expanded the role of the Parliament of Hanover. 
The constitution was revoked after William's death by the new king, William's brother, Ernest Augustus. For the remainder of his reign, William interfered actively in politics only once, in 1834, when he became the last British sovereign to choose a prime minister contrary to the will of Parliament. In 1834, the ministry was facing increasing unpopularity and Lord Grey retired, the Home Secretary, William Lamb, 2nd Viscount Melbourne, replaced him. Lord Melbourne retained most cabinet members, and his ministry retained an overwhelming majority in the House of Commons. Some members of the government, however, were anathema to the king, and increasingly left-wing policies concerned him. The previous year Grey had already pushed through a bill reforming the Protestant Church of Ireland. The church collected tithes throughout Ireland, supported multiple bishoprics and was wealthy. However, barely an eighth of the Irish population belonged to the Church of Ireland. In some parishes, there were no Church of Ireland members at all, but there was still a priest paid for by tithes collected from the local Catholics and Presbyterians, leading to charges that idle priests were living in luxury at the expense of the Irish living at the level of subsistence. Gray's bill had reduced the number of bishoprics' behalf, abolished some of the sinecures, and overhauled the tithe system. Further measures to appropriate the surplus revenues of the Church of Ireland were mooted by the more radical members of the government, including Lord John Russell. The king had an especial dislike for Russell, calling him a dangerous little radical. In November 1834, the leader of the House of Commons and Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Charles Spencer, Viscount Althorpe, inherited a peerage, thus removing him from the House of Commons to the Lords. Melbourne had to appoint a new Commons leader and a new Chancellor but the only candidate whom Melbourne felt suitable to replace Althorpe as Commons leader was Lord John Russell, who William found unacceptable due to his radical politics. William claimed that the ministry had been weakened beyond repair and use of the removal of Lord Althorpe, who had previously indicated that he would retire from politics upon becoming a peer, as the pretext for the dismissal of the entire ministry. With Lord Melbourne gone, William chose to entrust power to a Tory, Sir Robert Peel. Since Peel was then in Italy, the Duke of Wellington was provisionally appointed Prime Minister. When Peel returned and assumed leadership of the ministry for himself, he saw the impossibility of governing because of the Whig majority in the House of Commons. Consequently, Parliament was dissolved to force fresh elections. Although the Tories won more seats than in the previous election, they were still in the minority. Peel remained in office for a few months, but resigned after a series of parliamentary defeats. Lord Melbourne was restored to the Prime Minister's office remaining there for the rest of William's reign, and the king was forced to accept Russell as Commons leader. The king had a mixed relationship with Lord Melbourne. Melbourne's government mooted more ideas to introduce greater democracy, such as the devolution of powers to the Legislative Council of Lower Canada, which greatly alarmed the king, who feared it would eventually lead to the loss of the colony. At first, the king bitterly opposed these proposals. William exclaimed to Lord Gosford, Governor-General Designate of Canada, Mind what you are about in Canada, mind me, my lord, the cabinet is not my cabinet, they had better take care or by God, I will have them impeached. When William's son Augustus Fitzclarence inquired of his father whether the king would be entertaining during Ascot Week, William gloomily replied, I cannot give any dinners without inviting the ministers, and I would rather see the devil than any one of them in my house. Nevertheless, William approved the cabinet's recommendations for reform. Despite his disagreements with Lord Melbourne, the king wrote warmly to congratulate the Prime Minister when he triumphed in the adultery case brought against him concerning Lady Caroline Norton, he had refused to permit Melbourne to resign when the case was first brought. The king and Prime Minister eventually found a modus vivendi, Melbourne applying tact and firmness when called for, while William realized that his first minister was far less radical in his politics than the king had feared. Both the king and queen were fond of their niece, Princess Victoria of Kent. Their attempts to forge a close relationship with the girl were frustrated by the conflict between the king and the Duchess of Kent, the young princess's widowed mother. The king, angered at what he took to be disrespect from the Duchess to his wife, took the opportunity at what proved to be his final birthday banquet in August 1836 to settle the score. Speaking to those assembled at the banquet, who included the Duchess and Princess Victoria, William expressed his hope that he would survive until Princess Victoria was 18 so that the Duchess of Kent would never be regent. He said, I trust to God that my life may be spared for nine months longer, I should then have the satisfaction of leaving the exercise of the royal authority to the personal authority of that young lady, heiress presumptive to the crown, and not in the hands of a person now near me, 
who is surrounded by evil advisors and is herself incompetent to act with propriety in the situation in which she would be placed. The speech was so shocking that Victoria burst into tears, while her mother sat in silence and was only with difficulty persuaded not to leave immediately after dinner. William's outburst undoubtedly contributed to Victoria's tempered view of him as a good old man, though eccentric and singular. William survived, though mortally ill, to the month after Victoria's coming of age. Poor old man, Victoria wrote as he was dying, I feel sorry for him, he was always personally kind to me. William was very much shaken and affected by the death of his eldest daughter, Sophia, Lady Delisle and Dudley, in childbirth in April 1837. A watercolor sketch made by her during her pregnancy in early 1837 shows how frail he had become. William and his eldest son, George, Earl of Munster, were estranged at the time, but William hoped that a letter of condolence from Munster signaled the reconciliation. His hopes were not fulfilled in Munster still thinking he had not been given sufficient money or patronage, remained bitter to the end. Queen Adelaide attended the dying William devotedly, not going to bed herself for more than ten days. William IV died in the early hours of the morning of 20 June 1837 at Windsor Castle, where he was buried. As he had no living legitimate issue, the crown of the United Kingdom passed to Princess Victoria of Kent, the only child of Edward Augustus, Duke of Kent, George III's fourth son. Under Salaclaw, a woman could not rule Hanover, and so the Hanoverian crown went to George III's fifth son, Ernest Augustus, Duke of Cumberland. William's death thus ended the personal union of Britain and Hanover, which had persisted since 1714. The main beneficiaries of his will were his eight surviving children by Mrs. Jordan. Although William IV is not the direct ancestor of the later monarchs of the United Kingdom, he has many notable descendants through his illegitimate family with Mrs. Jordan including former Prime Minister David Cameron, TV presenter Adam Hart Davis, author and statesman Duff Cooper, and the first Duke of Fife, who married Queen Victoria's granddaughter Louise. William IV had a short but eventful reign. In Britain, the reform crisis marked the ascendancy of the House of Commons and the corresponding decline of the House of Lords, and the King's unsuccessful attempt to remove the Melbourne Ministry indicated a reduction in the political influence of the Crown and of the King's influence with the people. During the reign of George III, the king could have dismissed one ministry, appointed another, dissolved parliament, and expected the people to vote in favor of the new administration. Such was the result of a dissolution in 1784, after the dismissal of the Fox North Coalition, and in 1807, after the dismissal of Lord Granville. But when William IV dismissed the Melbourne ministry, the Tories under Sir Robert Peel failed to win the ensuing elections. The monarch's ability to influence the opinion of the people, and therefore national policy, had been reduced. None of William's successors has attempted to remove a government or to appoint another against the wishes of Parliament. William understood that as a constitutional monarch he has no power to act against the opinion of Parliament. He said, I have my view of things, and I tell them to my ministers. If they do not adopt them, I cannot help it. I have done my duty. During his reign the British Parliament enacted major reforms, including the Factory Act of 1833 the Slavery Abolition Act 1833, and the Poor Law Amendment Act 1834. William attracted criticism both from reformers, who felt that reform did not go far enough, and from reactionaries, who felt that reform went too far. A modern interpretation sees him as failing to satisfy either political extreme by trying to find compromise between two bitterly opposed factions, but in the process proving himself more capable as a constitutional monarch than many had supposed. British honours, foreign honours. As a son of the sovereign, William was granted the use of the royal arms in 1781, difference by a label of three points argent, the centre point bearing a cross gules, the outer points each bearing an anchor azure. In 1801, his arms altered with the royal arms, however, the marks of difference remained the same. As king, his arms were those of his two kingdoms, the United Kingdom and Hanover, superimposed, quarterly. One and four gules three lions passant gardened in paylor, two are lion rampant within a treasure flory counter flory gules, three azure a harp or stringed argent, over allen escutcheon tierced per pale and per chevron, a gules two lions passant gardent or, two or semi of hearts gules a lion rampant azure, three gules a horse current argent, over all an in escutcheon gules charged with the crown of Charlemagne or, the whole escutcheon surmounted by a crown. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.